Yes, Mr. Kirk. So, Lord, I'm now on page five of the skeleton. Um, and you'll see there are a number of bullet points under the heading key features of the policy. The first is preliminary procedural safeguard. I can ask you to turn up the policies. This is Medical Justice Corps Bundle Tab 17. And it was paragraph which of your skeleton? It's, well, it should be the thing that's after paragraph 11, but for some reason or other it's, it's been deprived of its own paragraph number. Probably because we tried to be fancy with a yeah. call at it. Not in my copy, it hasn't. No. That was, so I hope I've got the right one. But oh, all right, well, maybe mine, because I've had, I've had, I've had a few references. It's, so it starts it preliminary, pre pre preliminary procedural safeguards. Yeah, yeah. Um, is in fact 12. Mm. Well, that's 12. I'm so, oh, sorry, I don't know why I've got different formats. It always seems to happen, no one knows why. <clears throat> and you'd like us to look at tab? Tab 17, so this is the policy. So tab 17 of the Medical Justice Corps Bundle. Oh, right, sorry. So you've got a box towards the end of page 396. When does the notice period begin? So that explains if it's posted minute after midnight, otherwise in person time of receipt. But then it's the last couple of lines. Notice may not be given to a person with leave to enter or remain. Or during the period within which an in-country appeal or administrative review may be lodged in time or is pending. So that's the administrative review point I was mentioning just before lunch. And on the same subject matter, can I uh, refer you to uh, tab 18, which is the arranging removal guide, the same bundle. I'm sorry, I, I, I was thinking about something else. Um, I'm sorry, I missed the reference. Tab 18, same bundle, arranging removal. <coughs> You'll see at top of 454, four, there's a heading pre removal preparation. Subheading criteria to set removal directions. So you can only set removal directions if the following criteria are met. No outstanding casework barriers. And pick up that by turning to 456. Um, caseworkers are, are, are required subheading by the lower hole punch to check for any outstanding appeals uh, and applications. And at 457 that explains, final paragraph on 457, you must check the removal screen on the CID, that's the casework information database, uh, to confirm there are no outstanding casework barriers. So in other words, by the time you get the section 10 notice, you should have no outstanding matters and you've got no leave. Well, this is this is for setting. Um, That's removal setting removal orders, direction, which is not what we're concerned with. No, but it, it's it's the policy itself that, as I said, administrative review, no leave, etc., etc., yeah. and that's worked through in arranging removal. And then tab nineteen, another guidance document, liability to administrative removal. you to turn up page 512. If a person encountered with leave or in breach, sorry, this is below the box, application or other actions pending. If a person is, if a person encountered without leave or in breach of their conditions is a pending application or pending appeal or administrative review, you must not serve the red one. So that's the first bullet point, preliminary procedural uh, safeguards. 
then there's notice of uh, removal, sets out the various different uh, notice periods which we've looked at and I need to turn uh, up uh, again. Then there's a heading safeguards concerning uh, the ability. So where we, where you this is paragraph 13 of the skeleton. So if we go back to tab 17 of this bundle with the policy. We see a 399 in the middle of the page. Those not suitable for removal window. certain categories are excluded from the removal window policy. Yes. And the protection claims, as I said, that's underpinned by the statutory safeguards in section 77 and 78 and in 353A dealing with further representations in the immigration rules uh, and the reference to paragraph 353 of the immigration rules need to turn it up but the reference is call bundle authorities tab 10 page 123 then other headings about access to documents access to legal advice pending the uh, notice uh, period um, all those set out generally between 403 and 423, we've looked at them and I needn't take up time with uh, referring to them now, but I do rely on all these um, safeguards. And similarly, change of legal representatives. Can then I turn to paragraph 25 of the skeleton, or I hope it's 25 in your order because the format on the site. It should begin detention services order 62013. Uh, that's 26, 26 in line. So I'm one out now. Um, can I ask you to turn that up? That's the FB supplementary bundle volume one. Detention Services Order 623, Reception, Induction and Discharge Checklist, Supplementary Guidance. So these are for people now in detention. And can we turn to A14, Paragraph 5? Entering detention or change in detention locations can be stressful for detainees, may impair a detainee's ability absorb important measures for the first messages for the first time they're delivered. Sensor supplies are therefore encouraged to repeat important information at regular intervals using different formats such as posters and leaflets. <coughs> Supplier staff should ensure all processes are fully understood by detainees whose first language is not English. Professional interpreting services must be used whenever language barriers are identified on reception, induction and discharge. Uh, and that's picked up later at um, paragraph 25, which we'll come to in a moment. But paragraph 6, while well, we're still on page 14, the checklist at, at Annex A details the mandatory actions to be undertaken by the centre supplier at the point accompanied by expansion notice at B. You'll come on to those in a moment. But if we go to A16 to avoid jumping about, um, language skills about paragraph 19. During the reception process, staff will be expected to conduct a rudimentary assessment of detainees' proficiency in spoken English based on their reported interactions with escort staff and interaction responses with the initial introductions made by reception staff. Where telephone interpreting services are required, conduct the reception process to conduct the reception process. This should be recorded. Further 
assessment of English language proficiency should take place during the detainee's induction to the centre, where available written information should be provided either in pictorial form or in a language understood by detainee. Where detainee displays signs of a learning disability or literary issues, literacy issues, these should be noted by staff text, steps taken to ensure detainee is provided with relevant information in an accessible format. Then induction over the page A17 above paragraph 25. Check Mr. Annette D, that's page 25, we'll come on to that. Details mandatory actions to be undertaken by the centre supplier during induction, accompanied by explanatory notes at Annex E, that's page 26. Induction section session should be used as an additional opportunity to conduct a secondary assessment of the detainee's proficiency and understanding of English. Any noted proficiency recorded at the time of reception should be used as a benchmark for the secondary assessment. It's considered the initial assessment was not representative, if it's considered the initial assessment was not representative of the detainee's true English language ability, then the detainee's record should be amended accordingly. Where it is determined that the detainee has an insufficient knowledge of English to receive the centre induction, every effort should be made to conduct the induction in a language the detainee understands, where available written information should be provided in a pictorial form or in a language understood by the detainee. Then over the page, suppliers must be able to demonstrate they give suitable consideration to language needs and are responded appropriately, etc. Who are suppliers? What are they? Um, I mean, I can see that there's, I mean, obviously the thrust of all of this yeah. is that when, when, um, when someone's <coughs> taken into detention, um, proper efforts must be made to ensure they understand things. And if, yeah. it's, if English is not a first language or not a language at all, um, which will often be the case, then um, steps have got to be taken. Um, and, I mean, is this in support of a submission that by the time the, uh, the relevant document is served, um, there will be an understanding of an ability to um, cope with it? It's not an understanding that is focused exclusively on the service of the forms. It's more wide, it's wider than that. It's uh, an understanding of the procedures that are available to the detainee to contact lawyers, access legal advice, make further researching and so on. I'm sorry for labouring the point. Mm -hmm. it, it, you don't want me to read it out. It, it, 29.30 is important because it's the home office legal team. Um, Annex A, the, the checklist, note points 8, 9 and 21. So that's page 820. Yeah, that's 820. Points 8 and 9. So and again, this is an evaluation of language and then if interpreters are required. Yeah. D on A25, please note item 1, 2, To the forms, and again, if 
you will forgive me, I'll take you to these. First, the red one, Medical Justice Call Bundle at tab 9. Page 241, letter capital B. And you'll see at the bottom of that page, it's the red 0001. Notice to immigration decision, decision to curtail. Sorry, but. Let me just see if it's here, Mr. Covance. I think it was late, but I don't think it was yesterday. No, well, um, are there any spares there? I'm sorry, spares, they're, they're, yeah. those have not found my, their way into my bundle. Um, I think. Yeah. It, 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 this, this insert goes from 241B to 241W. And the last one, 241 W, is the one stop notice. So this is all the forms. I think my lords have the advantage of me on this occasion. I'm afraid so. So one set will probably be enough. That's very kind, thank you. I think my lord already has the one. of illegally staying in the UK, you have no lawful basis to remain in the UK and you should leave as soon as possible. By remaining here without lawful basis, you may be prosecuted for an offence under the Immigration Act 1971, penalty for which is a fine and up to six months in prison, etc. And then the next heading, halfway down the page, if you have further reasons for wanting to stay in the UK, and it sets out similar wording to what we've seen earlier, what you must do now and what you must do in the future, emphasising as soon as reasonably practical. So that's the red uh, one. Again, in my submission, it's in plain English. You don't need to be a lawyer to uh, understand what its import is. Also, the uh, red three form, and while well, keeping this open because it's got other forms in it, but can I ask you to look at the red three form and to find that? And we can see the one that was issued in FB's case. If you go to FB supplementary bundle two. You'll 
C on top right is headed red three. Page, sorry, sorry, C31. C31. It's all A's. In, in my bundle, I think they're all A's. Supplementary bundle two, one, two. Hang on. C31. Yes. So this is FB's red three notice. And you'll see in that heading box statements of additional ground under section 120. And again, sets out if you've got reasons which you've not explained before, tick the box and explain clearly reasons for wishing to come, grounds, etc., etc. Must do so. If your circumstances change, do so as soon as reasonably practical, and so on. And I don't ask you to turn it up, but just to work through the references in the Home Office file notes about this being served on FB and explained to him in diary, because there was an issue about that, certainly in the court below. Um, just to give you the page references, CC19, that's 1-9, C60, that's 6-0, So is the reality that somebody will be given um, a, 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 red, a red three and four at the same time, unless they've already had the red three when served with the decision to curtail or revoke leave? Yes, you initially, you get the section 120 notice is, I think, the same thing as the red two, which is the two, page 241W at the bundle. So this is headed in the top right, red two. One stop notice. One yeah. stop notice. So that should come with the red three. And then if you get a red four, you'll get effectively a reminder of the section 120 notice. And then red five is cancellation. That's set out in paragraph 29 of the uh, skeleton. And in the case of requests for extension, that's dealt with in the red six. And we can see examples of a red uh, six in FB supplementary bundle volume one. an example of that's a red five sorry red six that's red six where the notice has been cancelled and that three five nine where it's been extended and so again both of these are red sixes even though for some reason or other the number six doesn't appear on these ones Extending the window. Yeah, and then a three five nine. Sorry, three five nine is extending, and three five seven is cancelling. And is the one that um, covers not extending when being asked, or is that just conveyed in a letter? Uh, subject to correction by those behind me. I think that's that's just in in board because the, the current one will just stand. In other words, it hasn't been uh, superseded. Um, there's a bit in the skeleton next about chance flights, but I'll skip over that because we're not dealing with that at this uh, hearing. Um, I can then turn to the next 
major heading of the skeleton, the grounds of a peel, and that starts on paragraph 37. And the first point I want to come to is the access to justice point. statutory provisions which do require notice to be given to the uh, migrant. So call authorities bundle volume one Subject to paragraph 3 below, where a person is examined by an immigration officer and is given limited leave to enter or is to be refused leave, the notice giving or refusing leave shall be given within 24 hours after the conclusion of the examination, including any further examination in pursuit of that paragraph. And if notice giving or refusing leave is not given him before the end of those 24 hours, he shall be deemed to have given leave for a period of six months. So that's when you're being examined um, by the immigration officer and similarly section four of the same act which has been I hope inserted Sorry, oh, sorry, yes, 4i, it is 4i, yes. 4i, yes. thank you. Administration of control. Power to give, <coughs> a power under this act to give or refuse leave to enter the United Kingdom should be exercised by immigration officers. Power to give leave to remain or to vary leave shall be exercised by the Secretary of State unless otherwise allowed under this act. Those powers shall be exercised by noting in writing given to the person affected. So when you've got a valid application for leave, you do have to get, by statute, notice in writing of the decision on that application. Uh, and similarly, when we're dealing with um, a, appealable decisions, the Immigration Notices Regulation, this is Core Authorities Bundle, Tab 9, Regulations 2003, Regulation 4, Notice of Decision. Subject to Regulation 6, Decision Maker must give written notice to a person of any decision taken in respect of him which is appealable. So now to section effect. Now I take you to those to make the point that when Parliament wants, or requires rather, a notice to be given to the migrant, it says so. And it conspicuously doesn't say so in uh, section 10. And that's the context. Uh, in which I now ask you to look at Anna so still volume one of the authorities bundle. Tab 17. And paragraph 21 is on page 263.
and Lord Stade starts his judgment. My Lord, the question is how Regulation 73AB1 of the Income Support General Regulation of 1987 should be interpreted. In other words, it's a question of construction. And because it was a question of construction, Lord Brigham felt compelled to dissent, even though, in his words, it was uh, a conclusion he reached with distaste. But it was a matter of construction. And it's in that context that we turn to paragraphs 26 to 28. Because the principle of legality there being invoked is being invoked as a principle of construction. Now, my submission is, in this case, that there is no question of construction that arises in this case. Presumably, the, the candidate is Section 10 of the 1999 Act. But there's no question of construction that arises in relation to Section 10. It quite clearly does not require removal directions to be given to the migrant. Uh, and even applying in its most muscular form the principle of legality, uh, there is no legitimate way, in my submission, that you can construe Section 10 as requiring the migrant to be served with removal directions. Uh, and I, I do, uh, with respect to Dr. an observation that my Lord, Lord Justice Higginbottom um, made yesterday, that this isn't really a question of access to justice. Uh, there isn't really a question of construction in this case. So that is one reason why Anna Prajeva is not in point, and the other fundamental reason, which was the reason accepted by the upper tribunal and in turn by Mr Justice Friedman, Friedman, is that the principle that you must be given notice of any decision which adversely affects your right is not in play either. The Section 10 notice does not change your rights at all. Your absence of leave to enter or remain in the United Kingdom is not created by Section 10. Section 10 merely acknowledges your lack of right. It doesn't alter your rights one jot. So those two reasons I submit are the short answer why this case isn't about access to justice in the Anna Prajeva sense, at least, uh, at all. And it's in this context well, what, what, that... What, what, what sense, or is there any sense in which you accept that it is? I mean, presumably, it, it wouldn't be part of the Secretary of State's submission that a decision to remove somebody could be uh, taken. Forget whether removal directions need to be served. And uh, that, that person doesn't need to be told of it, can simply be picked up in the middle of the night and carted off to a plane and sent out. I mean, that can't be the submission. I mean, presumably, Section 10 has within it um, an, an obligation to tell someone they're going to be removed. Section 10 has the obligation to do exactly what it says on the tip, which is to say that you are liable to removal because you require leave and you don't have it. So I'm asking you about a decision, an active decision to remove. I mean, you couldn't keep that secret and just round someone up and push them off, could you? Well, I do submit as a matter of the construction of Section 10. Yes, I'm not thinking about no. Section 10. Okay, and as, as a matter of... It's, it's necessary to un, unpick the question, whether you, I'm simply answering it in the context of access to justice, no. or I'm answering it more widely in any public nor sense of unfairness or irrationality. If I'm answering it simply in the question of access to justice, then I do submit that provided you've got your forms giving you the removal notice period and the removal window, no further notification is required. All right, I, I think I understand the submission, but um, you, you, you'll need at least for me to deal with the, the uh, two examples that are very much in, in the forefront of the submissions we've heard. Namely, that there could be a request for deferral, which is refused, uh, and the person is immediately removed from the United Kingdom uh, with no opportunity to um, challenge that decision. Uh, that's example one. And example two, simply because it's such a familiar one to everybody, 
is um, a rejection by the Secretary of State of a fresh claim. And again, the argument that needs to be met is that that rejection could be indicated to a person liable or vulnerable to removal, and he or she is immediately removed with, with no possible opportunity of animating the courts to consider the legality of the decision. I think that's really at the heart of the argument that, that the Secretary of State needs to, um, needs to deal with. Yes, I, I understand that. Um, but rather than give a brief answer now, can I develop the answer by, by going through the submission, which is, is precisely the, 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 the point that I'm the, the exercise I'm, I'm seeking to undertake. The stage I'm at at present is simply to deal with the argument that Anna Frajeva is a case against me. Uh, and I have put forward two submissions why I say Anna Frajeva is not a case against me. Because you are given notice, and there's no question of construct, uh, statutory construction that arises. Um, and just on the same Anna Frajeva point, this morning you were referred to the decision of the House of Lords in VA Nigeria. Needn't turn it up. References Authorities Bundle, Volume 2, at tab 51, page 597. Now that, you may recall, was the question about submissions seeking revocation of a deportation order where the Secretary of State has not certified. And the House of Lords held, well, if the Secretary of State doesn't certify, you haven't lost your right of appeal. Now, that clearly was a question of construction of the relevant provisions in the 2002 Act dealing with rights of appeal. Contrast our case, I say, where no question of construction arises. the case of Unison, which is another facet of the Access to Justice Challenge. Unison is Authorities Bundle, uh, Volume 1, at uh, Tab 24. <coughs> and can I start with the leading judgment of Lord read at 65, that's page 435. Now, I commend all of 65 through to 85, and I'll, I'll try not to read out now any more than I need to. At 65, he has the heading, Unlawful Under English Law. Constitutional principles which underlie the text he refers to. One is the constitutional right of access to the courts. That's to say, access to courts and tribunals. Uh, and the other is that statutory rights are not to be cut down by subordinate legislation, except under the virus, uh, pass under the virus of a different act. And then at 66, he has that in constitutional right of access to the courts. The constitutional right of access to the courts is inherent in the rule of law. And he develops this. And 67, he says, it may be helpful to begin by explaining briefly the importance of the rule of law and the role of access to the courts in maintaining the rule of law. And at 68, between C and D, uh, in order for the courts to perform that role, people must, in principle, have unimpeded access to them, that's to the court. Without such access, uh, laws are liable to uh, become a dead letter. Now, the words that I wish to emphasise here are unimpeded. And then, working through, I can skip over to 71, but the, society, but the value to society of the right of access to the courts is not confined to cases in which the courts 
decide questions of general importance. People and businesses need to know on the one hand that they will be able to enforce the rights if they have to do so. On the other hand, that if they fail to meet their obligations, there's likely to be a remedy against them. It's that knowledge which underpins everyday economic and social relations. That is so notwithstanding that judicial enforcement of the law is not usually necessary, and notwithstanding that the resolution of disputes by other means, me methods is uh, often desirable. Uh, and my Lord, look, keeping that open, I submit that Mr Justice Friedman was making the same point of medical judgment in his judgment at 196, and that is, is Medical Justice Core Bundle Tab 7, is similar to wrongful arrest. You don't argue with the policeman on the street saying that I've got a legal right and you can't arrest me. You're going to be arrested, but you may have a remedy after the event. Now, ideally, of course, you would not have been arrested in the first place or perhaps placed in detention for a period. But in the real world, the law strikes a balance between allowing the police to discharge their duties and calling to them to the account after the event. But the important point here, and this is the point that Lord Reed was making, I submit, is that the policeman knows that he will be held to account. And that in itself is an important facet of the rule of law. And I submit that that same consideration and that same principle is in operation here. So going to the point that you're quite rightly putting to me, well, what happens if you do get a refusal very shortly before you're on the plane. That is part of my answer. The Secretary of State is accountable, both in the courts and, for that matter, in Parliament, for her actions. And if she is found to have behaved unlawfully in the public law sense, she will be held to account and a remedy will be available. Now, I quite appreciate that the migrant will say, well, I'd rather not have been put on the plane in the first place and not have to be brought back later on and left to my remedy and damage. I understand all that. But this is why, as I was saying before lunch, when we're dealing with this aspect of the policy, this is not an asset. This, this question of the remedy after the event being less desirable than the remedy before the event is not about access to justice, because you do get about access to justice eventually. The question is whether or not the desirability or efficiency of the particular remedy. That's not an access to justice point as such in my submission. That does involve questions of proportionality, balance and rationality. So my Lord, that's part of my answer to your questions of what happens to last minute refusals. Um, well, um, just to, just to um, examine that um, proposition. Um, Firstly, that remedy in a particular case may not be adequate. For example, in a, uh, an Article 3 case or an asylum case, if somebody is sent back to um, uh, mistreatment, serious mistreatment uh, in um, another country, uh, that, that would not be an adequate response to that. And, and also, doesn't an individual, when here, have the right not not to be removed. 
have the right to be removed and claim damages? Or is that not a good point? Well, as I sought to show, you have a statutory right not to be removed pending your determination and appeal of your asylum claim. So we're presuming you've gone through that process. You have the right under 353A of the immigration rules not to be removed pending a decision on your further representation. So we're presuming you've, you've gone through that process. You have the Secretary of State's own policy, which says plainly, one, if you've got a first time round asylum claim, you shouldn't be in the removal policy window at all. And two, further submissions that result in what is accepted as a fresh claim mean that your removal window is cancelled. So the policy addresses that. So we have to assume you've gone through all of that and you've got to a situation where, having gone through all of that, the Secretary of State has decided that your further representations do not amount to a fresh claim for asylum. So it's important in my submission that we're focusing on what the relevant category of cases are. Now, this goes back to the point I was making before lunch. Either you go to the logical conclusion and say that any time I claim that I've raised a protection claim, my removal's got to be cancelled. Secretary of State's got to make sorry, just, just, I'm sorry, just, just, I'm sorry to interrupt, just pausing there. That, that's not the... That's your submission. That's not the claimant's submission. The claimant's is that any, any time I have raised an asylum claim, uh, I have the right for that to be determined. Uh, and, uh, if it's adverse, from a decision from the Secretary of State, uh, a right to access uh, the courts to challenge that refusal. That's, well, that's the claimant's case. Yes, but as I, I sort of talked to you about a few minutes ago, we're dealing with a situation where the Secretary of State does not accept it's a fresh claim. If it is an asylum claim, you're not going to be removed unless the policy's gone wrong. And that's a separate point that, that we'll deal with. But the policy is quite clear. If you have made an asylum claim, you're not going to be removed until it's been dealt with. So we're dealing with cases where the Secretary of State has decided you've not made a fresh claim for asylum. No, I understand that. My Lord, my, yes, well, my Lord's question is, I think, I think um, as simple as this. Um, under the policy given somebody might be removed immediately after being told the Secretary of State doesn't, uh, doesn't accept you have a fresh claim. Um, where is the opportunity to challenge the Secretary of State's decision? Your answer, I think, is from wherever you're being removed to. Well, I have to accept that if the policy is going to operate at all, there will be some cases that, that fall into that category because the only logical alternative is that nobody will ever be removed as long as they well, say... I think logic, I mean, log logic can be strained. Um, I had understood um, uh, Miss, Miss Kilroy to, ex uh, uh, to, to accept in the sense that she, 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 she um, uh, didn't seek to in any way to um, distinguish um, what... Uh, this court said through a, a judgment of mine in, in SM, I always forget the SB, thank you, I always forget the, the, the initials, um, that the time comes where if, you, if it all comes too late, you can't expect the Secretary of State to look at it. Well, the, migrant, the migrant will say, I'm at risk here, well, I, I, sorry. Well, that's the, Ask that, rhetorically, that, that, there is no such point well, where... I haven't, you haven't been, either you, pull, you, you pursue the argument and say you've raised it, it has to be determined, or you don't. There's no middle ground is my answer to that. I see. Because there, there is no sensible um, objective criteria for determining a, a middle class of case where you have raised it, but the Secretary of State doesn't need to consider it. I mean, turning it round, how does the Secretary of State know whether she needs to consider it? Um, rhetorically, I ask. So that, that is my answer. Yeah. There, there will be such cases. The question is whether the policy provides sufficient safeguards, taking the whole run of cases as a whole, as to be a lawful way of dealing with that. But, but the response to that m m might be, and I, as I understand it from the appellants, this is their response. Um, that's, that, that's, even in that extreme case where uh, um, a, a fresh claim, fresh representations are made, 
very close to the, to the uh, time of departure. Um, and the Secretary of State says, I, I simply haven't got time to consider this. The, the, the um, appellants would say, well, th there is still a right to access to justice. You can still go to court and ask for an injunction uh, restraining removal. It would be on the basis that the Secretary of State uh, has not um, uh, determined uh, has, has not determined the, the fresh claim. And the, the court may or may not be impressed by that, but that would be the access to justice. Well, I agree. That, that's, sorry, we may be cross purposes, but that's why my submission is there is no access to justice point here. Because even if I haven't got a lawyer, I can phone up the, the, the judge in principle, in principle. So that there is no in principle infringement of the access to justice. Uh, in the same way that in the real world, I might not be able to afford to go to court because I can't instruct a lawyer and the law is too complicated for me. Those real world considerations are not regarded as infringing the principle of access to justice. This is why I have been emphasising Lord Reed's reference to hindrance and impedance in unison because there is no hindrance and impedance in getting to the court in any legal sense. There's no fee you've got to pay. It's not like some civil law systems where you have to appear by lawyers, you can't act in person, and so on and so forth. In that sense, nothing in the policy inhibits you. Go back to the prisoner cases on which the appellants rely. You don't have to get the permission of the prison governor before you can go to court. There's nothing of that sort here. So that's... That's why I say this is not in truth an access to justice argument in, in that sense. It may be an unfairness argument, and I'll, I'll deal with that in, in court, but it's, it's wrong to characterise it as a question of access to justice because going back to the limitation argument, so I'm, not, I'm not saying a limitation is a, is a direct analogy, um, but if you do have a last-minute representation, which is rejected and you are removed and the judge after the event decides that the removal was, was wrongful, you do have in principle and experience shows in practice as well, the ability to access the court and get a remedy. The remedy may not be in your sense the best remedy you could have had, but in terms of access to justice, nobody from the Home Office ever goes to court and says, well the court can't hear this claim because the migrant's already been removed. So in that sense, there's no, there's no touching of any principle of access to justice. But access to justice includes, as the, the case is made clear, in, in some cases, um, a, a, an ability to um, instruct lawyers and for them to uh, put forward uh, a, a, a case on your behalf. I don't know what the answer is, but that's a, a, a question, isn't it? In these, in these cases, how does that fit in? In a less extreme case than we've been discussing, what about if... Um, it, it is simply not possible uh, under this, under this um, policy to um, in, instruct um, a lawyer uh, and for the lawyer to put together um, a judicial review claim in 72 hours or in the window, there's no time at all. Well, what's, what's the answer to that? Well, that's something that the policy... As a, at the policy level, addresses in terms, and, and we've looked at all those questions. It, it's set out at length about access to documents, changing representations, opportunity to see legal advice, and so on. At the policy level, it's squarely all addressed in, in the policy. The appellant's complaint is, well, that's all very well on paper, but it's, it's not how the real world operates in practice. But in terms of the policy as such, it does address it squarely on. And in my submission, as a policy, nothing it says is objectionable. The objectionability, if there is one in my submission, is that in practice you can't actually get everything done in the time frame set out. But the policy does cater for all those matters that your Lordship has raised with me. But we have to look at the policy in the real world. Yes. If in the real world you cannot do these things in a substantial number of cases in the time you're given, or during the window, it's said, in no time at all, um, but how, how do we deal with that? Well, we'll come on to that. I, I dealt with that under the heading of fairness rather than access to justice, uh, which is why I haven't, haven't got to it yet. But the, 
the headline submission I want to make on access to justice is access to justice as understood in English law is really about putting up barriers or impediments to getting to court at all, either in terms of raising the fees or ouster clauses in the old cases that the appellants are relying on and so on and so forth. And there's nothing of that sort here. And just picking up again where we, we left off on Unison 72, Lord Reed pursues the same point about the knowledge that you may be held to the account, account after the event is also important. 72, um, picking up five lines down, but the possibility of claims being brought by employees whose rights are infringed must exist if employment relationships be based on respect for those rights. Equally, though, it's often desirable that claims arising out of their breach and employment rights should be resolved by negotiation or mediation. Those procedures can only work fairly and properly if they're backed up by the knowledge on both sides that a fair and just system of adjudication will be available if they fail, and so on. So, that in itself is an important aspect of uh, the rule of law. And in 74, we get to what was the impediment um, in that case, which is, it's not regarded as an infringement of access to justice to charge court fees. The question is, is the level of um, fees. And then 76 again picks up the same point about unimpeded access. And then he refers to the old Chester of Beats, and it's one of the cases on which the appellants rely, and other house the type court cases, and the 78, 77, another important general statement by Lord Diplock and Attorney General of Times Newspapers, the due administration of justice requires first that all citizens should have unimpeded, so it's all about whether or not impediments are being erected, and then 78 refers to Anderson and Raymond Honey as examples of those sorts of impediments. And similarly with 79. And then picks it up and follows through. 83 refers to the well-known case of uh, Witham. So I, I commend all of that up to 85, uh, but I, I won't read out any uh, more uh, today. So you draw a distinction between those cases like Chester case that the, you can't bring an action for possession without the minister's permission. And indeed, I think it was a criminal offence to bring an action for possession without the minister's permission. Um, you say that, that when you say impediment to an access to justice, that's what you yes. say the law is talking about. Yes, I do. So it's a hard edged. Just continue on, on this Anna Prudeva point, if I can call it, um, question of construction. If, and I submitted it's not, but if it was a question of construction in this case, then as we'll see when we come to look at the case of, of W, uh, the appellants would face a, a higher threshold than if it's not regarded as a, a question of uh, construction. And we'll come on to W uh, later. Uh, so that's the first limb of my answer. Um, about the varies of the uh, policy on access to justice. Uh, the second limb, and this is paragraph 44 of my skeleton, is I do submit that the appellants have misunderstood with respect both what the upper tribunal and Mr Justice Friedman said about that. Um, and if we can pick it up in the upper tribunal judgment first, so that's the FB4 bundle, at page 
161 puts up the unison judgment. And 162, it's an integral feature of a power of removal such as that conferred by section 10, that if a person is to be removed under the power, the court must come when his or her ability to access the courts and tribunals of the United Kingdom in order to prevent removal, in other words, before the event rather than after the event will disappear, and that by the same token, during the period leading up to removal, that person's ability to access the courts and tribunals will be progressively diminished. It's quite manifest in our view that Section 10 authorises such a state of affairs. If it did not, the power of removal would effectively become meaningless. Uh, and that, in a much shorter and more elegant way, is the submission I've been seeking to put um, to your Lordships this afternoon. It's the same point. If the policy is to permit removal to take place at all, it has to operate in such a way. Uh, and it's worth, I'm sorry if I made this point before, that the very same objection would arise if we had none of this policy and we just had removal directions. Because you can still make last minute representations after you've been served with removal directions, which haven't been considered before. So this point about last minute decisions and immediate removal has nothing to do with the policy. It arises, it would arise exactly the same if there were removal directions and not removal window. It, it's not a point that touches the removal windows aspect uh, of home office practice at all. And that's why at 163 the tribunal um, talks about this being the inevitable context, consequence of the power to remove a person from the United Kingdom. Because I do submit it is indeed the inevitable consequence. Uh, and similarly, uh, Mr. Justice Friedman, in his judgment, so this is the medical justice call bundle, And that's why I 
submitting the skeleton at 44, that the appellants do misread what those learned judges say. They were not saying that the right as such is diminished, only that the practical ability to exercise it before removal is diminished as the relevant deadline uh, approached. And then at the next paragraph, I give an analogous example of delaying seeking the queer Timet injunction. If, if you do wait until 10 seconds before the house is about to be demolished, you're unlikely to get your injunction. Uh, and again, to reiterate the points I made earlier, damages for wrongful arrest. It's a remedy after the event. It's not as good for the person concerned as not being arrested in the first place, but we don't regard that as a denial of access to justice. And then the third strand over at point 46, which I call start, which is the point I've, I've made a number of times, that the inevitable conclusion of the appellant's argument is that the migrants do have a veto on removal. And there's no getting away from that. And indeed, the migrants themselves, certainly in the courts below, they're a bit more equivocal now, made no bones about it that that was exactly what their, where their argument led. What's happening at the moment? By Mr. consent, the justice, Mr Justice Walker's injunction has been continued. Yes. So the removal window policy has been continue to be suspended pending the termination of this appeal. Yes, and in practical terms, what's happening then? I mean, is it Removal the directions are being served. Yes, and are applying the old policy of timetabling for that? 72 hours, yes, that, 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 the, 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 that hasn't changed at all. Um, and the, is there, I mean, it, the, it, there are a number have, of... Have, have the, those being removed, are they... Are they affecting a veto on removal? Well, I'm anxious not to be accused of, of giving evidence. I mean, I have no, asked... But, but I think, I mean, we, we all have, uh, Mr Kovacs, a good deal of experience as judges in the administrative court, uh, judges doing the, um, the immediate applications, judges on overnight duty, judges in the Court of Appeal doing the same sort of... Um, doing the same sort of work or happily less and um, I mean there are I mean there are um, abuses uh, they're, they're spoken to in many authorities but I mean, it, speaking for myself the, the idea that, that it, it's, it's possible sort of on day one to make a, an application uh, as a fresh claim it's refused day two you make another one day three you make another one at nine o'clock in the morning, you make another one at lunchtime, you make another one at tea time, and you make another one just before you board the plane. That's just not, it's, it's, it's not, it's not what happens. Well, well, that's what you're envisaging, isn't it? Uh, can I answer in two minutes? One, there are cases where last minute removals are made right up to people on Certainly. the plane. Yes. So it does happen. Uh, and secondly, as I said earlier, the access to justice point doesn't depend on whether you get removal directions or a removal window because you can make last minute representations under both. You get your 72 hour removal directions but there's nothing to prevent you from making last minute representations after 14 or even 71 hours. So it, it's, not a, it's not a vice if it is a vice, it's not one that's cured by serving removal directions as opposed to a removal window. But if you're asking, quite the point it, I was asking yeah. you, but, but sorry, then I've misunderstood. No, I, I, I don't think it's worth spending time on it. Let, let's go on. Remov removals are continuing, but I, I don't want to give. No, no, no I understand evidence. that. I, um, what, what, what I was trying to explore with you was whether, um, in the current environment, where people being removed are given notice of the time and place of removal. Okay, so the old scheme, if I can call it that. Um, which is, in broad terms, um, what one of the things that the appellants say uh, should be happening now. In other words, there should be uh, some notice of when removal is going to take place. We appreciate we've got the other uh, decisions being made which can't be challenged. But if, if your submission is that um, by giving notice to people of the time and place of their removal, you give them a veto on ever being removed. I'm just, I, I, I just don't follow it. 
in, in, in the light of the experience of decades, where true it is, there are many cases, um, and they've been identified in the authorities, where there has been um, abuse, and abuse regrettably not only by uh, individuals, but also by lawyers. I mean, we, 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 it's, it's, it's in the authorities. Um, but it's never, it's never resulted in practical terms in a veto being given to anybody. So, my Lord, uh, as I uh, clearly not successfully sought to explain, it's not the giving of removal directions or not that gives the veto. Removal directions and removal windows are equally subject or not subject to veto. The veto is, is nothing to do with removal directions. The veto is the idea that access to justice means that every time I say something is a fresh claim, my say-so is enough to say that everything's got to grind to a halt. Okay, and a, with the greatest of respect, I mean, that was part of what we wanted to deal with in SB, that the time comes where it's just too late. It's too late. You can, you can, you can try, but it's too late. Anyway, um, well... I appreciate that a time does come when it's just too late, and that's exactly what the policy allows for. Now, the argument may be whether or not the policy's acceptance of the point at which it's too late arrives is lawful or not, but to that extent, what your lordship's putting to me is precisely what the policy is seeking to achieve. It's seeking to recognise that there will indeed, in some cases, become a point where it is too late. But in other cases, there won't. And the policy is designed, as this is why I started with a policy equality statement, to do a whole raft of things, which are all, in my respectful submission, submission legitimate. Now, one of the things that the policy inevitably has to grapple with is that those claims, in inverted commas, that are too late. And I've got to face the argument that's being put to me is that you must provide a, a guarantee that there will never be any such claims which are effectively written off as too late. I'm accepting that there will be such claims that are too late for effective access to be dealt with before removal, though not barring the event remedy after the event. So I'm accepting that there will be cases which are too late. So I'm really agreeing with your Lordship there. Under the policy, and it's the policy I'm defending, it acknowledges that in the real world there are indeed cases that come just too late. But, but doesn't the, the, the appellant's point is this, isn't it? Doesn't the policy say uh, that it becomes too late after 72 hours after service of the uh, RNW? Because um, after 72 hours, um, there is substantial evidence that in lots of cases um, a, a claim cannot be put together one reason or another, in 72 hours. Uh, the individual is, li is, is uh, at risk of removal in hour 73. Do you say that that's then too late? Or, in, a, in other examples we've got, once uh, a paragraph uh, 353 decision is made, that something is not a fresh claim, uh, that um, I immediately that that um, decision is served, it's too late to access justice. No, on, on the contrary. Um, one, my starting point is that the notice period is sufficient because it's at least as long as you would get under removal directions. But putting that to one side, the fact that your notice period has expired does not under the policy mean that the Secretary of State is not going to look at your representations. On the contrary. So it's not the expiry of the notice period, which under the policy means that your representations are written off as too late? No, not at all. But under the policy, just, just looking at the policy, not, not what happens in practice, but under the policy, what could happen is uh, that a, um, a, a, a further representation go in uh, after the uh, start of the window, um, and while the Secretary of State is looking at them, an individual could be removed. Not under the policy. That's not supposed to happen. The policy, and this is why I showed you the arranging uh, uh, removal. You can't set removal directions when there's any outstanding casework. You can't set them. But, but the, 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 in this sense, as I understand it, 
the removal window notice effectively sets the, the period. That sets the period. So if um, later representations are made in the window, we're not talking now about setting the, the period or removal directions. They've been set. We're talking about what, what's to happen within the window. And within the window, they're at risk of removal, aren't they? Under the policy. No, under the policy, they're not at risk of removal before they've had a decision on their representation. But as soon as they've got the decision... Yeah, I agree. As soon as they've got the decision, um, that they're at risk of, of being removed. Yeah, this is what I'm accepting. There will be some cases in which the interval of time between rejection of the latest representations and actual removal may be too short for somebody to, to bring up a judge and get an injunction. So, so for those those people, it is, in that sense, too late? In that sense, it's too late to do anything about it before removal. I'm not accepting it's too late to hold the Secretary of State to account after the event. I understand that. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. And, and I do submit, it, it has to be a binary question. Either I accept that there will be some such cases or there will indeed be a, a, a veto on removal. Because the only way in not having cases which are too late is that every single representation has to be considered, decided upon, and had the opportunity to go, go, go before a judge. Uh, and it, it, it is, at that level, it does become a binary question. And as I understand the appellant's argument, they do say that there must not be a single case in which the representations do come too late, though they seem to have rode back from it in their, in their latest submissions. But once they concede that there will be some cases where the representations come too late, then their access to justice point falls away because it's no longer an absolute guarantee. And it's the word absolute that the appellants have been relying on both below and here. Either it is absolute or it's not. That is a binary question. Can I then move on to uh, a different uh, aspect uh, of this, um, which is what the relevant threshold is? For seeing whether the policy is inherently unfair. And I I'm seeking to characterise this in fairness terms um, the appellants may say that it should be seen in access to justice terms, but I've given you my access to justice submission, so I'm saying that this is really to be addressed as a question of uh, fairness. Now, the appellants rely on unison, and they also rely on the Court of Appeal decision in uh, BF uh, Eritrea. Um, BF Eritrea is a decision that was recently considered by uh, the uh, Divisional Court in the case of uh, W. Now I appreciate the Divisional Court's not binding on this court, but because it is a, a recent decision and I do submit it's helpful, can I ask your Lordship to turn it up? So this is the Core Authorities Bundle. Uh, at uh, tab 28. Now, this was a challenge to persons who have been granted leave under the 10-year route uh, as parents and who had a condition of no recourse to public funds on their uh, leave. And the challenge was to what the appellants called the scheme, which comprised 
the Immigration Act, the immigration rules and guidance about when such a condition would be uh, imposed. And what the Divisional court, court did is they considered the cases, they considered cases in particular, um, the Court of Appeal decision in what's JCWI number two, so Lord Justice Higginbottom's judgments in, in that about the approach to be uh, applied here. And what the court drew from the authorities, in particular the Supreme Court decision in BB and JCWI and the Court of Appeal, is that when you're considering uh, legislation or delegated legislation, um, the question is whether it's capable of operating uh, lawfully. Uh, when you're considering guidance, the uh, question is a, is a different one. And can I take you to the relevant paragraphs of the judgment in W? Above 52, there's a heading, the tests applicable to challenge to immigration rules and instructions, so instructions of guidance. I can pick it up at um, 56. In our judgment, these passages show two things. First, in a challenge to legislation, including immigration rules, which are treated by the Human Rights Act as subordinate legislation, the challenger must show that the legislation is, as Lord Justice Higginbottom put it in JCWI 2, incapable of being operated in a proportionate way in all or nearly all cases. And that's why they conclude uh, at 71 that the challenge to the immigration rules fails in that case. Picking it up, going back to 57, the second proposition that can be drawn from the judgment in BB, however, is that the stringent test applicable to challenges to legislation does not apply where the challenge is to guidance. Here the question is whether there's a significant number of cases in which the application of the guidance will lead to a breach of convention rights or of some other rule of law. And then he refers to a passage from Fiat Eritrea, in my view, the correct approach in circumstances of the present case is straightforwardly that the policy or guidance will be unlawful, if but only if the way in which the frame creates a real risk of more than a minimal number of children being detained. And then at 58, in the specific context of challenges to guidance, a test of the kind applied in Phoebe, does the guidance lead to unlawful results in a significant number of cases and BF? Is there a real risk of the guidance leading to an unlawful result in a more than minimal number of cases? Seems to us to be consistent with principal guidance of the kind under consideration here is directed to case workers. One of the principal functions is to assist them to make lawful decisions to well establish the court can and should intervene where guidance is misleading to, as to the law or will lead to or permit or encourage uh, unlawful acts. Uh, and then finally, can I also refer to 68. Uh, we recognise, as Lord Justice Underhill notes in BF Eritrea, in the passage cited at 56 above, that in any large scale decision making system, there is the potential for apparent decisions. The existence of apparent decisions, even several of them, does not necessarily mean that the system itself is uh, flawed. Now, my Lord, as I understand it, the, question, the case of BF Eritrea is itself an appeal to. Supreme Court. So subject to the qualification of one, what the Supreme Court says in BF Eritrea, uh, and two, reserving my position in case this case goes further. Um, Lord, I respectfully am content to invite your Lordships to adopt the same approach in this case as the Divisional Court took in the case of W. So in other words, if there is an attack on Section 10 as such, or the immigration rules as such, then it's the high threshold in Phoebe that the court must apply. If the challenge is indeed to the policy in JRI, then it's the question of uh, a, significant, a significant number of cases allowing for adverse uh, aber aberrant decisions as set out in, in that case. So, my lord, coming to the point, uh, 
what I'm getting to is this case is not really about access to justice. It's about applying this test to how, we operate, how this policy operates in practice. As to how it operates in practice, I'm unconscious of the time. Um, my submission is that the upper tribunal, comprising very experienced judges in this field, and Mr Justice Freedom in the medical justice case, gave a very thorough consideration to the evidence, uh, and they reached conclusions which they were fully entitled to reach on the evidence, uh, and which I invite your lordships in turn uh, to adopt. Certainly they contain no error of law, they didn't misunderstand the evidence in any material way, they didn't reach any decision which was perverse or beyond their margin of judgment. Uh, in short, there's no good reason for this court to take any different view of the assessment of the evidence and for what that says about the lawfulness of the policy than those judges took in the court and tribunal below. And I submit that what's, when that is done and the test in W is applied, the answer is that the, the policy is lawful. So that is how I invite this court to approach uh, this uh, appeal. So using a significant number of cases, do you say that applying that test in, 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 on the evidence that we've got, we've all, we've all read the evidence, and the evidence is that um, it, it, in some cases, the appellate say in a substantial number of cases, uh, it, it's simply not possible to do everything within the time limit, 72 hours, uh, but perhaps even more central now to their case is that uh, once the window starts, there is no time at all to do anything. Because as soon as um, a, a material decision is made, there's a risk of the, the migrant is at risk of removal. Um, but but is your response to that, as I understand it, I just want to clarify this: that um, you they are at risk as soon as the decision is made. They are at risk in that sense under the policy. But in practice, um, uh, as in a lot of the um, cases we've looked at. Um, there, there is no restriction on access to justice, stroke on procedural unfairness, uh, because for one reason or another, um, they got the access to justice which they sought. Uh, try to answer that and say, after the notice period has expired, they are at risk in just the same way they would be at risk if they'd been served with notice of removal directions? Well, no, they have served with, I mean, removal directions are, are binary. You, you either go on the, on the flight or you don't. Well, exactly. So, Your removal notice period is at least as long as the removal directions. So you can't be worse off by getting the additional space of the removal window than if you had removal directions and immediate removal. I understand that. I understand that. Yeah, so yes, you are at risk, but you're going to be at, at risk if you get served with the removal directions. And if, if the real complaint is, well, 72 hours, and of course it's not 72 hours in all the cases, it's, it's other periods and other class of cases, but we just call it 72 hours for shorthand. If 72 hours is not enough, then solving, you're not going to solve the problem by serving removal directions, because it's still 72 hours. Which is why I say that this case is not about removal windows as opposed to removal directions. It's really about whether you're given a reasonable, fair, whatever label you call it, time to do what you can legitimately expect to do. Um, so, yes, if removal is to be affected at all, 
there will always be people who are at risk that if they leave it later and later, it's going to be more difficult for the Secretary of State to consider their representations and give them a decision before actual removal. And I accept that if, which is not the case, if, which is not the case, the Secretary of State had a policy or a standard practice of never giving you a decision on your further representations until you were on the plane being removed and couldn't do anything about it. If that was a deliberate choice by the Secretary of State, I might well not be here trying to defend it, but my submission is that's not what the policy is set up to do. And if people do make representations, there is no evidence that the Secretary of State deliberately delays consideration or service of the decision to make it more difficult for the decision to be challenged. And I don't understand the, the appellants who are putting their case on that basis. So the Secretary of State is not obstructing access to justice in the sense that he's deliberately delaying giving them no she's deliberately delaying giving them notice of the decision. The Secretary of State has to field whatever representations are are made to her. If they're made before removal is scheduled in good time, the likelihood is you'll get a decision in good time before the scheduled removal. If the submissions are made very shortly before the scheduled removal, then inevitably it follows that the chances are that you'll get a decision on those representations a shorter and shorter time before removal. And the later the representations, and the more complicated they are, so the more time they need to consider, are all factors to be taken into account. And somebody has to make a judgment as to whether or not to cancel the removal window, defer removal, and so on and so forth. And all of that is addressed by the policy. So the policy is not blind to these real-world considerations. The policy seeks to address them. Now, whether or not in practice the policy is successful or not turns on the evidence. But in my submission, there is no legitimate criticism of the way that the policy seeks to do it. Because the only way in which the fundamental objections of the appellants could be met would be having a policy which did give a veto. Once you move away from a policy which gives a veto, it is inevitable that in policy terms there will be a scope for decisions which are served very shortly before removal. Because, and this isn't stretching logic, if removal always has to follow from at least seven days or whatever period after the latest decision, if that is the policy, it always has to follow X period of time after service of the decision, then there's no getting away from it. It does give a veto to migrants on removal. Uh, where there is a material decision within the window, say a, a, a paragraph 353 decision or, or, or a decision on a, a, a Dublin 3 decision, or whatever, um, that decision is made, as soon as it's made, within the policy as I understand it, those individuals are at risk of being removed. Correct. Do you, do you say that they have... Well, assu assuming that the decision is adverse. It, it, of course, yeah. yeah. But, 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 but in those circumstances, do, do you say that the, um, the migrant uh, has either, has a, a, a right to access to, to the courts, um, uh, in, in real terms after that decision is made uh, and or that it would be procedurally unfair for him not to have that reasonable opportunity? Or do you say that as soon as the decision is made um, there is nothing unlawful in terms of access to justice or procedural unfairness in shipping that individual, removing that individual I I immediately? Well, I did 
do need to answer that in, in layers. In, in terms of, of purely the right of access to the court, you have a right of access to the court if need be after the event, but there's no question of saying you can't come to court at all. In terms of having a reasonable opportunity, that in my submission is precisely what the policy seeks to outline. The policy has to provide guidance for caseworkers in the real world. It has to give them sufficient flexibility to deal with the myriad of different circumstances that arise on the one hand. And on the other hand, it has to give them sufficient guidance to try and minimise the, the risk of all sorts of different caseworkers making all sorts of different considerations for all di decisions for different reasons. And that's what the policy has to try and do, to provide strike a fair balance for caseworkers, to provide them with a workable approach, which is also fair. So your Lordship, in his question to me, used the phrase of reasonable opportunity. And my submission is that is indeed precisely what the policy seeks to achieve. And I submit further that the evidence shows that that's what the policy is achieving. But in respect of the, in, in my example, the para, paragraph 353 decision, the policy does not say something like uh, case workers uh, must give a, a reasonable opportunity for the individual to, for the migrant to challenge this decision in court. There's, there's, there's nothing after the decision's been made. The policy is silent. Isn't it? Well, I, I quite agree. The policy doesn't have a separate stage after service of the adverse decision, which itself provides for a reasonable opportunity. The policy is quite clear on that. Uh, and I submit that it has to be like that, and I'm sorry if I sound like an old record, otherwise you do give the migrants a veto. If you provide a separate stage, you provide a veto. is in fact able to access the court by phone or by lawyer or whatever will always depend on the facts of the individual case. But there's no deliberate delay under the policy. And the policy is certainly no less generous than would be serving removal directions. There is criticism of the same day removal policy in the Quality and Human Rights Commission skeleton and following. However, as set out above, this has not been operated since it was stopped with effect from the 1st of August 2018. It does not therefore arise for consideration. Previously considered by the tribunal is reasonable and proportionate. Just to note that although at one stage there was a policy for some categories of being detained and removed same day, that ended in August 2018. I'm conscious of the time, and while I rely on the entirety of the schedule, I don't think there's anything more 
on the domestic law that I need to take you to. So I was then going to um, turn to the ECHR and to Dublin. And that starts at paragraph 72 of the skeleton. ECHR arguments do, in my submission, add uh, nothing. Um, obviously, Article 3 is an un unqualified right, but the policy itself is quite clear that if somebody has made uh, an Article 3 claim, they shouldn't be removed. Um, the contentious point comes where the Secretary of State says you've not made an Article 3 claim. Uh, uh, and the uh, appellant uh, or migrant uh, disagrees. But that adds, adds nothing to the same arguments on, on the common law. Dublin, I need to say... Well, I'll just pause there. So, so possibly, at least uh, possibly, that um, your argument that ex, ex, ex post facto legal action, in other words, being able to take proceedings after you've been removed, um, wouldn't be good enough for, for Strasbourg, would it? Well, this comes back to my taking you to uh, Lord Reed in unison, and the aspect of the rule of law of knowledge that you're going to be accountable. So what I say is the, the, the additional safeguard in that is the Secretary of State knows full well the consequences for which she will be accountable if she does remove somebody and it turns out that they had made an Article 3 claim. So that's how I say that particular um, concern is addressed. Certainly, um, if we put aside the uh, aberrant decisions, which I, of course, ex ex accept to happen, it's certainly not something that the policy as such uh, contemplates. But going on to Dublin, this is paragraph 74 and uh, following of the uh, skeleton. Dublin regulation is authorities bundle volume one at uh, tab twelve. And the relevant article is Article twenty seven remedies at page one four three. Member states shall provide for a reasonable period of time within which, within which the person concerned may exercise his or her right to an effective remedy pursuant to paragraph one and three. The purposes of appeals against or reviews of transfer decisions, member states shall provide in their national law. The person concerned has an opportunity to press within a reasonable time, and those repeated references to reasonable time are in my submission why the policy is consistent with Dublin because clearly Dublin does not intend that nobody can be subject to removal to a third country under Dublin until they actually exercise their remedy. There has to be a period in which that right, so long as it is a right, is exercised. And how long is that period? The answer we are told in the Dublin regulation is reasonable time. So it, it does come back to the question whether or not the policy does give a reasonable time for this to be done. But if the argument is that Dublin itself provides some absolute right in every case,
to go to court in my submission. That's simply not what Article 27 says of Dublin. It is subject to the qualification you've got to act within a reasonable time. The question is, what is the reasonable time? And can I also refer to the case of Gesselbash, that's Authority Bundle Tab 4, at, sorry, Volume 4 at Tab 83. Dealing with the European law cases, the next section of the skeleton is the case studies from paragraph 89 onwards, and I won't take up time by going through those in my oral submission. But in addition to what's in the main part of the skeleton, there's also what's set out in Annex 2 to the skeleton, where we give further commentary on that. And then at, uh, I think it should be 92, that uh, should be heading the policy is rational. Sorry, I'm 
just the right. Sorry, I've got the wrong hands on that. Which is the case we're looking for, Refugee Legal Aid Centre. consideration for a very very long period of years not only within the Home Office but in conjunction with also the courts and with practitioners as well so of course it's the Secretary of State's policy but it is one that is born out of a long period of experience and interaction with other bodies as well to the various references given in the section of the skeleton, which I think starts at 98 on that, um, can I also ask you to uh, add a couple of further references. Um, FB Supplementary Bundle 2 at C112, which is uh, 15th of November 2017 letter, which is when he actually made representations and the 29th of November 2017 letter when they were rejected that's FB supplementary bundle 2 at C124 this afternoon. I know Miss Ree is on top of all the factual evidence that was before Mr Justice Friedman uh, and uh, unless you indicate that it would not be helpful uh, I would invite you to hear from her briefly because I think she has some points that she wants to make on the, on the facts. Could, could I ask just one last question yeah. on, 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 the, on the substance? I, I, haven't, I haven't thought this through but you, you you focus uh, one of your um, uh, 
one strand of your argument is that, um, that the migrants will have the right to access to justice from abroad, having been removed. How, how does Kieran Bindloss um, impact on that? I mean, in, in that case, um, it was said that um, appealing from abroad um, may not be um, sufficient to challenge a decision because a number of reasons. One was uh, the giving of live evidence by the migrant, but, but also there was um, because of an inability properly to instruct solicitors. Do, do, do you say that has any impact on that strand of your argument? Well, my Lord, um, can I answer that in two stages? One, subsequent to the Supreme Court's decision in Chiari and Bindloss, there have been a number of out-of-country Section 94B appeals. Um, they're now at various different stages, and they're subject to a number of different challenges by, by the appellants, uh, and some of them are coming up before this court um, later on uh, this uh, month. So the Secretary of State has taken on board what was said by the Supreme Court in Kiarin being lost. The facilities and arrangements for Section 94 appeals, a lot of work has been done on those, um, and we say that they're working satisfactory. That some appellants argue to the contrary, and as I said, there are a number of challenges to that at various different stages of the court. So I don't accept that it's I, that the Chiara and Bindloss is either authority for the proposition that you can't appeal from abroad. Well, or it's, not, have, it's not authority. It's not authority for that. Um, nor do I accept that subsequent experience has, has borne out the concerns that the Supreme Court had. So that, that's one, one level of it. Um, secondly, we are dealing with a rather a different aspect because if your claim's certified, then you, you go abroad and then you start your appeal from scratch. Here we are positing in these last minute cases where you may or may not have been represented in this country. If you were represented in this country, you've already got a lawyer acting for you who has got your case and doesn't have to do that much more work in order to get you back from what he had to do to stop you going in the first place, if you, if you see what I mean. So it's already a work in progress. If you take putting the case as high as I can against myself, somebody who is, is unrepresented and with the best, let's, let's, let's say, put it as high as I can against myself, with the best will in the world, make some unintelligible last minute representation, which is regarded by the Secretary of State as completely hopeless and repetitive or whatever. And he doesn't get as far as getting a lawyer and because he can't contact the duty judge, he doesn't contact the courts before his departure, then, yes, I, I'm realistic enough to accept that going back to another country which may have much less developed systems, because there will be a whole range of these countries, and we can't treat them all the same, but there will be some where his ability to get access to legal advice about English law may be difficult. If he had no lawyer when he was in England, And I can conceive that there may be cases where he may be in real difficulty in trying to do anything for the first time from abroad. But I don't think any of the examples you've been given fall into that category, which may be an indication of how rare, if not non-existent, they are. Yes, thank you very much. Yes, yes Ms. Reid. My Lord, thank you. Um, with the Court's indulgence, I, I would like just to come back on some of the case studies as they are, in, in my submission, a material part of medical justice's uh, appeal. Um, we say that um, Mr Justice Friedman's judgment, when properly uh, considered, demonstrates that the approach to be adopted was a contextual one. Um, that is, he considered whether the individuals in question had access to justice by reference to uh, the facts of the, each of the cases as they were uh, available to him. Um, and that is certainly the approach that we urged upon him um, below. Um, so uh, where there is 
uh, an issue of potential concern uh, with access to justice, then the further question that he also then went on to ask uh, whether, is whether it was by reason of the changes introduced by the policy or the criticisms directed at the policy that those difficulties or potential difficulties arise. And we say again that that was entirely uh, the, the correct approach and my lords need to look no further than unison to see that in that case what was at issue was the fee increase uh, and so therefore the relevant evidence before the court in that case was the impact of the fee increase on access to justice. So these are all features of Mr Justice Griefman's uh, analysis and I could take my lord to some of the case studies which make uh, good that point and we say any other approach uh, would risk collapsing in part, or at least part of the challenge, to a challenge to the 20, 72 hours period per se. And Mr Justice Friedman was quite careful to state um, below that he would not be entertaining any form of backdoor challenge to the 72 hour period, as that would have knock-on implications possibly in relation to uh, the removal directions position. Um, and we say a further risk that he there, thereby avoided um, was conflating a number of other issues. And this goes back, in fact, to uh, my Lord Lord Justice Hickenbottom's question in relation to the 2014 Act, which did um, bring into force a number of changes in relation to the structure um, of the various different immigration acts, including the 1999 Act as well as the 2002 Act. Uh, and my Lord, I'm, I'm not proposing to turn up those provisions in any detail, but in summary, in essence, and my Lord has seen um, the reference to the explanatory notes uh, to the 2014 Act. It may be that that um, is one document that my Lords have not um, seen, but it is that um, perhaps which provides a shorthand through this. So, so this is in the core bundle behind tab Two decision three, the removal directions, 
Um, as Mr. Covert sought to explain, the practice uh, was to serve uh, removal directions on the individual, um, and the practice in that respect has now changed. Uh, and my Lord can perhaps see a hint um, of uh, that in the way in which Section 10.1 of the 1991 Act has been amended. There is no longer a reference to removal in accordance with removal directions, and the power to issue removal directions has been decoupled and put into Section 10.7. So, so that is the statutory framework. We are not saying that um, the 2014 Act requires the Secretary of State no longer to serve removal directions, but one can see that uh, the policy gives effect to the uh, policy underlying the 2014 Act in order to provide for a more efficient uh, yet fair system. And the fairness in part comes through uh, the amendment to Section 120, uh, which Mr Kovacs took my Lords to, uh, and the relevant change is that the Section 20, 120 duty is now an ongoing duty. Um, and that notice can be served at various different stages in the process. So to, to paraphrase, effectively what is, one is seeking to do is to front load the process so that the end point, uh, the sharp end of the process, is not unduly clogged up uh, with further representations. Yes, of course, there will be late representations, uh, some of which will be legitimately made, but the purpose is to shift uh, as many of those representations uh, to, to an earlier point in the process without, of course, precluding an individual from making those further representations, uh, whether during the notice period or during the window. So that is, um, um, that is the context, and that is why one has to be careful when considering the causal link that Mr Justice Friedman was quite keen to identify in some of the cases as to whether the error in that particular case, or the frustration or the denial of access to justice, was a function uh, of the particular criticisms which are directed against the policy, and not, as I understand it, against uh, the Act. So that is the legislative landscape, and it's against that landscape that I uh, want to come back on some of the case studies. <coughs> so, my Lord, um, medical justice's position in relation to the case studies is considered in the judgment from paragraph 106 onwards. <coughs> so my Lords will assume that Mr Justice Friedman deals first with the uh, Navarretti case studies uh, and then goes on to consider the deferral and the uh, unlawful removal cases. Um, my Lord, I'm not proposing to go through each and every case, uh, nor each and every case uh, my learned friend uh, took my Lords to uh, earlier, but I would invite my Lords to consider the cases under the following headings. So sequentially, first, um, has the individual had prior access to legal advice? And uh, I mean not necessarily only within the 72 hours or the five days in a Dublin case, but are there legal representatives on the scene or have there been uh, or are there indications that there might have been? Um, and this is significant not only in uh, the asylum, previous asylum claims types of case, but also significantly we say in the Dublin context. Um, and it's obvious why medical justice focuses on those Dublin cases, because they are by definition cases where there won't have been a prior consideration of asylum in this country. Um, and so on one view it's at the opposite end of the spectrum to the abusive capacity cases. <clears throat> but here, even in the Dublin context, the moment will see this from the way in which Mr Justice Friedman described the cases, it's not unusual for individuals to have had legal representatives well before the service of the uh, notice. Um, so, for example, um, my Lord will see in relation to MN1, which Mr Justice Friedman deals with from 106, there is reference in 106 and 107 to um, legal advice 
been taken after the making of uh, an asylum claim. Uh, and then reference to the individual travelling to London to see a legal representative. Uh, and in 107, there is reference to uh, the take-back request uh, and a letter which ought, he ought to have received by the terms of Article 4 of Dublin 3. And the date of that letter, which, uh, except there's a dispute on the facts as to whether he received it, is October 2017. Um, and the window opened the following year in June 2018. So he was re-detained and served on the 5th June with a notice of making of a uh, window on the 8th of June. So, um, and, and there are other instances um, where legal advisers were on the scene prior to uh, the uh, service of the notice. And for my Lord's note, these are MN3, uh, which uh, at 116, MN4 at 120, MN9 at 136, MN10 at 141, and these are all references to the paragraphs of Mr Justice Friedman's judgment. The next heading is, um, are there cases where uh, a claim has been issued in the notice period? So I'm not talking here about the window, um, but the 72 hour or the five day period. Um, I might all we'll see in relation to MN9 uh, that a claim was in fact issued in the notice period. And so paragraph 119 uh, is MN4. Um, um, my lords will see that the removal window opened in June 2018. Um, paragraph 120, um, the individual had instructed a firm to act for him since at least 8th of January 2018. Um, and then uh, 121, Wilson sent a PAP letter on the 19th of June and a new removal notice was served on the 28th of June uh, 2018. Um, with uh, removal window to open on the 5th of July. In the meantime, judicial review proceedings were instituted on the 4th of July. Well, in fact, that's a slightly um, different case or similar case in the sense that it was a claim issued in the second uh, removal window. Uh, but MN9 perhaps is perhaps a more straightforward case where um, a claim was issued in the window. Um, the judgment, in fact, uh, at 136 onwards does not, in fact, record the issuing of the claim and the date, but the underlying um, document which sets out the Secretary of State's factual position, which I don't believe is contested, is at SB1 of Medical Justice, page 82. Um, my lords will see that um, a claim was lodged on the 15th of June, and that is uh, one day before the removal window opened on the 16th of June. So that is a clear example of a, a claim being issued in the 72 hour period, um, and MN4 is a claim where there were legal advisors on the scene um, who triggered a second window, um, and, and the claim um, was then issue. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, my Lord's seen reference to case one, um, Annex 7.1, which Mr Justice Friedman deals with at paragraph 1981. 
uh, and um, my, my learned friend relies on that case. Um, but if I could ask my lord to turn up SV2, page 1290. This is um, one of the unlawful removal cases, and my lord will see from paragraph one that the challenge in this case is to the legality of a notice of removal. So that is an example um, of a case where an individual having been served with a notice um, challenges the legality of that notice without waiting for uh, a decision on further reps which may or may not come um, before the expiry of the 72 uh, hour period. So there are instances, we say, of uh, access to justice, effective access to justice, um, even before the expiry of the 72 hour five day um, notice period. And the next heading, my lord, is legal action in the notice window, and, and this is the principal mischief that both Malena friends seek to uh, direct against the uh, policy. And we say that there are several instances of legal action um, in the window period. And this goes factually to the point about uh, immediate removal. Uh, and we say that there are at least six or seven cases that demonstrate, uh, and this is just within uh, the appellant's own case study put forward in uh, Miss Navarati 1 of legal action having been issued. So again, if I ask my lord to take up Mr Justice Friedman's judgment, 108 is uh, MN. One and uh, my lords will see that initial review claim, uh, this is the last line, was filed on the 22nd of June, and this is after the opening of the window on the 8th of June. So, yes, uh, the individual was at risk of removal, but on the facts, uh, the uh, a claim. Uh, was issued within the window period. Um, MN2, which starts at 110 on the same page, what we'll see from 111 and uh, 112 that a pre action protocol letter was sent out on the 30th of June. Uh, and that is after the opening of the window on the 23rd of June, so one week after the opening of the window, a PAP letter was sent, which then uh, resulted in the uh, withdrawal of the removal notice. MN3, which begins at 114, again, my lords will see uh, that an injunction was sought and obtained pen pending removal, uh, and that is uh, at 117. MN4, over the page, paragraph uh, 121, I've taken my laws to this already, um, a PAP letter was issued during window one leading to new removal notice in respect of which a claim was issued um, before window two. Um, so again, access to justice. Uh, MN8 uh, at 131. Uh, one. Um, my lord will see 
from 132 that further reps were refused on the 17th of November uh, and the individual was able to seek interim relief on the same day. Um, MN10, which is uh, another case that my a friend relied on, I believe it was her third case summary um, this morning, at uh, 1, 4, 3, a judicial review was issued by the 30th of November, and that was following service of the seven-day notice of removal window on the 8th of November 2016. Um, <coughs> MN11, one, four, seven. Um, so just as for MN10, this individual was seen by Wilsons uh, in the legal advice surgery in detention before the opening of the window um, and uh, action was then taken. So again, far from evidencing the, the risk or the breaches that my own friend sought to indicate. These are, the majority of these cases are in fact cases which demonstrate that in the real world uh, there are opportunities to access uh, legal, uh, access uh, justice. So, um, These are a far cry from the types of instances which would be necessary to begin to be able to show systemic unlawfulness. Um, the further point that uh, Mr Justice Friedman made was that there was no explanation in many of these cases. Are you able to deal with this in, in two minutes because we are going to have to rise before 4.30? Yes. Um, Otherwise we can, we can take it up in the morning if you're going to be longer than that. Which um, my Lord, I, I, may, I may be about 15 minutes, so in which case it... I think we would be better uh, taking that up in the morning. Thank you, Lord. Would it be, um, uh, through, through you as you're on your feet, um, Miss Reed, would it be inconvenient if we were to sit at 10 o'clock tomorrow morning? Don't, don't hesitate to say it would be if it really would be. But if it isn't, I think it would. It would. Um, well, look, we're, we're content. Yeah, everyone so seems to be yeah. content. Well, um, all right. Well, we'll we'll adjourn now until um, ten o'clock tomorrow morning, and we'll we'll hear the remainder of your submissions, Miss Ree, and then we'll hear further from um, Miss uh, Nike and uh, Miss Robin.